Hey guys, welcome in. In this video, I'm gonna tell you about one of my favorite moments and my absolute favorite Beethoven sonata, where Beethoven literally invents pop music. Now, before I give away what that moment is, I'm gonna play two pop songs for you first that use that same chord progression. Now, the first one here is a classic. It's actually hard to believe this song is already over 50 years old. That's by Simon and Garfunkel, 1971, No Road Home. But for those of you who maybe weren't following pop music back in the 1970s, don't worry. Next example is much more recent. This comes from Ed Sheeran's first album, plus a little song called This House. And those of you out there who are actually huge fans of both artists will know at this point that I made those up. They don't exist. I lied. Because in fact, that chord progression right there is the chord progression we're going to talk about from Beethoven. But before we get to that moment, we need to kind of take two steps back here because I need to explain to you what makes a progression sound classical in the first place. If I'm saying that progression sounds like pop music, what makes most of Beethoven's sonatas not sound like pop music? Now, one of the key ideas behind so much of classical music is this idea of function. Like chords are not just there and they sound good together one to the next, but there's some sort a function, some sort of progression. The chords have some sort of logical sequence they're going in. I'm going to show you what that sounds like from the last movement of Altstein Sonata. About halfway through it, we get this right here. Obviously, that sounds super Beethoven, but we have to ask ourselves why it sounds like Beethoven. So the C minor, and then so we kind of had a C and then a five, seven, a C, that one to go back to C. And then we do it again in F. However, one big misconception about classical versus pop harmony is that the classical one has to use a lot more chords and be a lot more complicated. It probably does have the potential of using more chords, right? And have the potential of being more complicated, but it's not always about the sophisticatedness of the progression. For example, this third movement starts out with C chord, still C chord, G chord, C chord, G, C, G, C, G. G, C minor, G, C major, G, C minor. Actually, it's one of the simplest classical progressions out there. You do a bunch of one chords and a bunch of five chords that want to go back to one chord. So what makes this piece so special is that we started out with that progression. Simple, but still very classical. Also, it has a progression that goes. First part again. We go into that third part. We eventually go back to the first section again. And this is where we're heading to. I remember literally opening this book for the first time when I was playing this piece and I had to get over a little bit of fear because I was like, that's a scary page of music right there, right? So what I did was like any reasonable person that said trying to memorize every single note of this entire page. I was like, let me just memorize the chord progression. If I can memorize the chords, then the notes will be pretty easy. So I was like, C chord, F chord, C chord, D minor. Ooh, there's some sharps thrown there for chromaticism. C chord, G chord, C chord, cool. C, F, C, D minor seven, chromaticism, C chord, G chord, C chord. I was like, life is good. C chord, G chord. I was like, oh, that's slightly different. C, G, I'm expecting C. But Beethoven does this, C, G, D minor, a minor and at that moment you're like okay i think there's a little sequence going on here just a little like a little tiny sequence but here's what happens c g d minor a minor we think e minor but instead f and then here's the big one G suspended, which is a super pop sounding chord. I recognize suspended chords show up everywhere in classical music as well, but just to hit a 
big suspended chord here to G to C. And I remember playing that chord progression just thinking like, wow, I feel like I'm just playing pop music. But then if that wasn't extreme enough, check out what happens in a minute here. Beethoven kicks off the four page coda. That's one of the most memorable things about Falstein Sonata. It's really fast. It's really flashy. It has a super cool chord progression, which is the focus of this video. It also has other, you know, small details like octave glissandos that are definitely more notorious and famous in the piano world. We're going to focus in on about five lines into the coda. Beethoven does this. brings back that pop sounding chord progression from earlier in the video. But this time, not only does he do that chord progression, but the left hand actually does kind of sound like the song I made up earlier. It goes like. I can remember learning Waldstein and getting to this just four pages from the end and just thinking that has to be one of the craziest early 1800 chord progressions that exists because it just feels so much like it could have been taken right out of music written in the last 40 years and transported back in time. And just to be completely clear, I'm not making fun of Beethoven or making fun of pop music or making this video. I know some people might hear it that way, like I'm saying like, oh, Beethoven wrote stuff like pop music. If, if you've been around the channel before, you know Beethoven is my absolute favorite composer and Waldstein is my absolute favorite piano sonata he wrote. So we're literally talking about my favorite piece by my favorite composer. And I'm also not trying to imply in any way that pop music is bad. It's just fascinating to me that Beethoven wrote the Waldstein sonata with the first movement feeling extremely classical in lots of ways, like a very classical obviously late, but very classical sonata. The middle movement being extremely weird. This last movement here, you could say the middle movement's an intro to the third movement, but whatever. The third movement being extremely romantic in lots of ways with all the pedal. In fact, that could actually be a modern chord progression that's written in the last 10 years right there. But it does all that, and then out of nowhere just does this. Hope you've enjoyed this look into just one small aspect of one of my favorite pieces ever written. If you want to learn more about chords or support the channel in general, I really suggest that first of all, subscribe, like, comment down below, but also I have a Patreon page with more content there. Thanks for watching. See you guys next one.